Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java Junkies. Welcome back to another episode of t for c If you're a political junkie or a data geek, then this is the episode for you because my next guest is an expert on U.S. elections, including the influence of political advertising on voting behavior, public opinion, and political communications, among other topics. But before I introduce you to Professor Lynn Vavrick, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's Time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you a sneak peek at the guests and the professions we're going to be featuring that week. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign-up box is right there on the homepage. Now, my friends, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew, because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Professor Lynn Vavrick, the Marvin Hoffenberg Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at UCLA, where she teaches courses on campaigns, elections, and public opinion. She's also a contributing columnist to The Upshot at The New York Times and a co-author of Identity Crisis, the 2016 presidential campaign and the battle for the meaning of America. Her 2012 award-winning campaign book, The Gamble, was described by Nate Silver as the definitive account of the 2012 election, and political consultants on both sides of the aisle refer to her work on political messaging as required reading. In 2015, she was awarded an Andrew Carnegie Fellowship to investigate the influence of political advertising. And she has served on the advisory boards of both the British and American National Election Studies. Professor Vavrick Lynn, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am ready to go. But not caffeinated? Both. Oh, oh, good, good. What kind of uh, caffeine is your preferred beverage? I'm pretty agnostic. I'll drink a cup of coffee. I'll have a latte. It's all good. Okay, excellent. Well, let us dive into our 10 espresso shots. And we're going to frame these questions around your field, which is political science with an expertise, a focus on American politics. And as you described it to me before we started this interview, publicly engaged social science. Does that sound good? That sounds good. All right. What entry level jobs are available to young people who want to break into this field? I think if you're interested in any kind of research, there are tons of opportunities to get your hands on data. I would say if you're curious, if you want to know something about how the world works, whether that's in the social sciences and the hard sciences, or just in general, getting through your day to day life, learn how to find data and how to use data to answer questions. That would be my suggestion, is find some kind of job where you're going to get training in data analytic skills. And I noticed that early in your professional life, before you got to UCLA, you were at one point the director of panel development at Polymetrics, which has since been acquired by YouGov, and it engages in survey research and analytics for research needs. That's right. That was my sort of fun startup experience, a company in Silicon Valley and and kind of one person's idea. And we were trying to move polling off of telephones and onto the internet. And so I got to be a part of, of that mission. And now that 
company is going strong. And I didn't know how it was going to work out. But like a lot of things that I think all young people should do, thought it was a good idea. And so I committed myself to seeing what would happen. Cool. So what is a useful hard and soft skill or skills that you look for, Lynn, in the young people that you've hired over the years? I'm almost always looking for three things, no matter what position I'm interested in hiring for or what kind of work I want the person to do. I want you to be a good listener. I want you to have emotional intelligence. So I want you to be aware of the people around you and what they are thinking and possibly feeling. I want you to know what you are thinking and feeling. And the third thing is, and this, this might be more important than the other two. I want you to have a problem solving orientation toward the world. I just want to hear all ideas about how we're going to get from where we are right now to where we need to be an hour from now. I love that. And I I especially (laughs) love the focus on problem solving because plenty of people can point out what the problems are. But if you aren't thinking about how to fix it, it doesn't do you much good. Yes. Okay. Now, the next one, I think I know what the answer is, but is someone's major a deciding factor to get into your profession? In other words, If they haven't studied political science or whatever it is they want to teach or research, is it a deal breaker? Absolutely not. I can't say this loud enough or enough times. For most things that you're going to do in your life, it does not matter what you studied in college. It matters that you went to college. And the things that happen to people in a traditional four-year college experience, those are the kinds of things I just talked about figuring out, are you a problem solver? Do you want to be a problem solver? Can you be a problem solver? Are you a good listener? Can you practice doing that? Can you figure out what other people are feeling? Are you someone who hurts other person, you know, other people's feelings all the time? Or are you sensitive to that? How can you become more sensitive? That four year experience or six years or three years or however long it takes you is super important in developing those skills. And those skills are going to serve you well, no matter what you go and do. Now, if you want to be an architect or an engineer, you need to develop some skills to do that. But in the humanities and the social sciences and the business world, all of those things, if you want to go to graduate school, medical school, law school, whatever, these kind of more basic professional skills are what's important. Oh, my goodness. I love that, too. First of all, I was wrong. I thought you were going to say that the person's major did matter. Really? Yes, I did. But I have to say the way that you just responded to that question resonates very much with my own experience now from having interviewed hundreds of professionals in dozens of different careers. And the way that I describe it right now is that young people should think of their major not as the tiny house that they're going to be forced to live in for the rest of their lives, but rather as the foundation of a professional skyscraper that they are going to be building for the rest of their professional careers with each new job and each new career, adding another floor in that skyscraper. Now, that's a great analogy. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) So how important is it to have a graduate school degree in order to succeed in your field? And again, your field is being a college professor of American politics with a focus on publicly engaged social science. Most universities and and nearly all research universities require graduate work in order to be on the faculty. There are some examples of colleges and universities that have visiting lecturers or professors of practice. Those are people who are not members of the faculty. They are teaching courses at the university. This is one of the things that's kind of neat about working at a college or university, and people don't really appreciate this, but most places that college faculty or the university faculty, it's a pretty special thing. It's a hard group to become a member of. So the graduate degree is a deal breaker. You got to have one if you're going to be a member of the faculty. Great. Thank you. What about life experiences, Lynn? So these are the experiences that happen outside the classroom. What in your experience do you think are the most useful ones for someone to have starting out in your field? 
there are lots of useful life experiences for life in general, but particularly related to the kind of work I do. I think that you got to be, you got to be wrong once you're going to be wrong more than once, but that first time and, and big, you got to be wrong big and you, and it just has to happen. And you have to feel how horrible that feels in that moment when you have made a big claim, you have put your training expertise and reputation behind it. And someone comes and says, no, you messed this up or you, you dropped a row of the data or you typed this when you meant to type that and you actually executed a different command. Like that is, that just happens. People make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Two things have to happen. You have to feel that and know that you don't ever want to feel that way again so that you will be more careful going forward. But you also have to understand that it happened. And so you have to put a plan in place for how to deal with it. How do you get up the next day and go back to work and do it again without just giving up and throwing in the towel? Oh, wow. I can't wait to ask you about what your Mm -hmm. big fail was. And I'm happy to share (laughs) mine, although we would be talking for a very long time if I were to share all of my big fails. (laughs) So, And actually, for our young listeners, if they want to learn more about what Professor Vavrick does in her current job and how she built her remarkable career, check out the show notes for this episode to see if her main time for coffee interview has already dropped. What is the best part for you, Lynn, of being in this profession? There's so many great things about my job. I think the best thing is I get to think about topics and questions that I want to think about when I want to think about them and as much as I want to think about them. And I get to dig into them. It's like being a detective and try to figure out what's going on. But I'm not trying to solve a case with a couple of people. I'm trying to sort out big relationships that are happening across hundreds of millions of people in the population. And I really like that. I like the creativity of it, the curiosity of it. I like to write. So I enjoy trying to convey to people what I've learned. And I also like to teach. I love that moment where I say something to someone and they react and say, oh, I get it. Wow. I didn't know that. To me, that's hugely rewarding. Mm, Fantastic. Well, as we both know, it doesn't matter what your job is, even if you love it most of the time, there are always aspects that we don't love. So what is the part of your current job, Lynn, that sucks the most? (laughs) This is a great question. Committee work? No, no, I, 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 I don't really mean that. I mean, it is tedious, but very important. You have to work in groups. You have to get things done to move the organization forward. I guess it's hard to deal with people. And I know that seems really generic, but whether I'm talking about students or colleagues or other vendors who I'm working with on, you know, providing data or or things like that, it, it is just sometimes hard. And everybody thinks that their needs are the most important. Everybody thinks they are the most talented person who has walked in the door. There's far too little empathy and far too much focus inward. And I, and sometimes that just gets to me and I try not to be one of these people that says kids today, but (laughs) in many ways would like the young people who make their way into my office to take a little bit more responsibility for the situations that they find themselves in instead of blaming me or the world around them. Fair enough. So three final espresso shots. What is the best career advice you've ever gotten? I think the best advice that anyone ever gave me is keep your head down and do your work. There's just no better way to remind yourself of what's going on than to say that when you get distracted, when you get sucked into the drama of these personal you know, conflicts at work, which everyone does, just keep your head down and do your work. Oh, yeah. It's a waste of your energy, although it's very tempting. And I have to say, I have gotten involved, but I think you got to listen to the professor here. Just stay away from it. Two Mm. final espresso shots. What movies, if any, or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon shows or books do you think accurately depict your profession? You know, I thought long and hard about this and I wish I had like the answer. This is, I think, 
as close as I can come. When I was in high school, a very popular movie was the debut of the Indiana Jones series of films. First one was called Raiders of the Lost Ark. And if the listeners have not seen it, you should go watch it. And you, you're just going to love the theme song. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, the lead character played by Harrison Ford is a college professor. And I remember seeing that film when I was in high school and he's in the classroom and he's teaching, he's an archeologist and he's teaching something interesting. And I thought, wow, like that's so great. And then throughout the film, he goes on this adventure and he gets, he's trying to put his knowledge and expertise from the work that he's done, reading books and writing his research papers. He's trying to put that to use in the real world. And of course, because it's a movie, he's trying to save someone's life. There's a damsel in distress. (laughs) And I remember thinking when I saw the film, wow, is that what college professors do? And obviously I am not, you know, swinging from the trees and, and, you know, with a leather, with a leather satchel and, and whatnot. (laughs) But that was, that was really inspirational to me that he, he just got to work on what he was interested in. And then he got to apply it in the real world and take the Hollywood out of it. And I think that's a pretty good depiction. The other one I'll just add quickly was again, from my adolescent and childhood years, the Mary Tyler Moore show, which is just the story of a, of a young woman trying to make it in the world. And I think the show does a great job of putting her in situations where she's trying to balance being a woman and being a professional at the same time. Terrific. I love both of those examples and we'll make sure to include them in the show notes. Final espresso shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession? I think things that people don't realize about college professors is that very little of our responsibilities involve teaching in the classroom. So I mentioned before committee work, there's a ton of that. We have to run the place. So we we are administrators. We have to advise our graduate students. We're training other people to become college professors. That's a huge chunk of my time. We're writing books, we're writing papers, we're doing our research. And all of that can't do that in just eight hours a day. So pretty much we work nonstop all the time. No summers off. Yeah, you get summers off, but not really. (laughs) It's a big switch. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure. Well, Professor Vavrick is the co-author of Identity Crisis, the 2016 presidential campaign and the battle for the meaning of America. And by the way, it features a new afterword that discusses the 2018 midterms and today's emerging political trends. I want to thank you, Lynn, so much for making time for coffee today with me me and the Time for Coffee community. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of t for c And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org, or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.